So one of my main roles um, during my eight years as the Stig was, the, was to teach the celebrities how to drive what we call the star and the reasonably priced car. I mean, to put it in context, it was a Suzuki Liana. It, it would be the sort of bottom rung of a rental car. You'd go to the airport, you, and if that was all that was left, that might be what you would, you would accept as a, as a four-wheel transportation. It was basic, it was manual gearbox, although we did have a, a, an automatic as well. Um, we had a few guests from America who had not experienced the stick shift. These people were, you know, very successful in some shape or form, you know, actors, musicians, you name it, politicians. They were there to do the, primarily to do their interview with Jeremy, but as a as part of it, the experience was this roller coaster ride with me in, the, in this car. You know, I'd introduce them to the track. I'd always do a slow lap, try and make them feel comfortable before we then made them uncomfortable because racing a car, driving a car fast is utterly re removed from day-to-day -day driving. You know, everything you learn to pass the driving test goes out the window. Even how you, you learn how to turn the steering wheel, we all get taught to shuffle around with the wheel. That's the first thing that has to go because when you're driving fast, the tires get stretched and stressed. You need different ways to control the wheel and look further ahead to see where you're going and anticipate the corners and all those things. And I only had sort of 10, 15 minutes max to try and impart this 20 years of knowledge to someone who just arrived. But really, it was simpler than that because everybody had different expectations. Everyone has different strengths and weaknesses. And my role was to, to get the best out of each person. And that was the fun part. So you, you get to meet someone you've probably seen on television. And ultimately, you, you're then just dealing with the human being. You know, what are they good at and, and what do they enjoy or not enjoy? Not everybody enjoyed it. I mean, I remember Jack D came. He's a comedian and he's very sarcastic. So I thought he was just taking the piss with when he was saying he wanted to get out of the car. We were doing 30 miles an hour. And he said, I'm having flashbacks. I need to get out. And then I only realize he meant that when he actually opened the door. So oh, this wouldn't be good if he's gonna, he's gonna barrel roll out on, it, on his feet and, I'll, and again, I'll get fired. Kind of had to talk him through and really build his confidence up and get him to a place where he was actually going really quick. And I, you know, when he was driving, he was doing 90 miles an hour through the, the fast curves and I was really excited for him and asked him at the end, you know, did you enjoy that? And he just said no, and then walked off and went and did his interview. So other than a few that didn't enjoy it, I think mostly everybody learned something and had a good time because it's it's really invigorating you you learn a totally new skill um you do you do get control of your adrenaline and you you get a different focus when you're when you're driving at those speeds and it, it it's i don't know it's something surreal as you know for human beings we're only designed to do 12 miles an hour but we adapt pretty well to much higher speeds yeah some of the coolest ones we had i mean it's amazing meeting f1 drivers and seeing them approach a, you know a cheap car with the same seriousness as they would a formula one car i wasn't there for vettel but you know i, I heard because all we you know we still talk about this stuff with all the producers that were there you know, he was checking tire pressures and things like that which actually you know no one ever had ever bothered to do i don't think anyone had ever serviced the car you could tell this because a lot of the guests well it happened three times when a wheel fell off um which was embarrassing i think the first one was lionel ritchie and the front the front right wheel separated it from the car and, and off it went Comedians always seem to be the most challenging. I don't know why that is. I don't know if that's something to do with the way their brains are wired, but there was a couple of them. Chris Evans was one and Jimmy Carr was another one who had no sense of survival at all. So in, if, as the instructor, if you weren't aware of that quite quickly, you know, you, you needed to pay attention because you, they, they could be spinning towards a tire wall backwards. And they wouldn't even consider braking. So you had to sort of impart a sense of fear in them that was absent. And they just thought the whole thing was, was funny. So that was comedians. Another one that nearly took us out was uh, David Walliams. He, again, I think, I don't think he was enjoying himself particularly, but wanted to do well. Which is, so it's always a tough combination because the hardest person on, your, on yourself is you. And he was starting to skid wide. We would set the camera up at the exit of the corner to sort of capture um, him crossing the line. We'd seen a few laps and he seemed to be consistent. So we, we moved the camera in a bit. And I could see that something was going wrong because he was going through the corner and continuing to turn. And the further he turned the steering wheel, the less that it actually steered in that direction. And he was coming towards us. So I was kind of jogging backwards and I was trying to helpfully indicate that he should get off the throttle and straighten the steering wheel. And this sort of sign language wasn't helping. So we then just grabbed the cameraman and just ripped him out of the way. And um, yeah, he skimmed past the tripod camera where the guy had just been standing and spun into the into the field. One of the stories I'll never forget was that one of the people we we um, had on the show, a guy called Billy Baxter, who was blind. To achieve a lap with him required a totally different approach. He couldn't say turn left at the tires or watch out for the white line. We had to completely reinvent 
instruction. I, I was using the hands on a, on a clock face to indicate how much to turn the steering wheel, lots of expletives to give braking and acceleration notes. And Billy sort of really took this on and, you know, it was ex-military guy. So again, really good at taking training on board and responding quite quickly. And he actually beat four sighted celebrities, including Boris Johnson, who was the prime minister, who was, I think, on a two minutes and two, and Billy managed a one minute 58. So poor old Boris, you, you know, he got to take that one on, on the chin. Maybe he needs to go back when I go and beat Baricello's time. We had a real mix, a real, a real blend. It was Simon Cowell with another unique driving style, but very fast. The fastest, though, actually, on average, were the ladies. We had less female guests on the show, but if you, if you did a pro rata, they were the fastest. So the, and I think the fastest was Ellen McCarthy, who'd been around the world on a, on a boat by herself. She's pretty tough-minded. And Jennifer Saunders, another comedian. I think she was the fastest that we ever had. It would be down to her and Ronnie O'Sullivan. So another self-taught guy. So Ronnie was very, very fast, very natural, very gifted. But Jennifer Saunders, I think, it's po- I, don't, I just don't think she does, unless she was a dark horse and she was quietly getting track time, I think she was just genuinely talented. She was probably the fastest person we ever had. And you would never know. She's just very polite. Oh, lovely, darling. This was a wonderful day. And then just, just dropped the hammer, braked incredibly late and was able to really finesse the car and, and work the tyre. So just, you can never judge a book by its cover. My last guests went out with the bangs, Tom Cruise and Cameron Diaz, which was pretty epic. And those two were, were, were really competing uh, because they, they obviously got on really well. I think it was Night and Day was the film they were promoting in the UK. And it, as it does at Dunsfold and in England generally, it hammered down with rain. The whole place was kind of flooded. So they were doing their laps in the, in the reasonably priced car at the time as a Kia Seed, big red lump. It wasn't as fun in a way as the Suzuki, which had a bit more roll. It used to loll around in the corners and you could just, you know, they're both front wheel drive. They're both fairly sedate, but the Suzuki had a bit more life to it. So anyway, they'd gone out. Cameron Diaz was the quicker of the two in the rain, but, you know, the rain is, it's one of those things it changes, you know, so it, maybe it was heavier when Tom was out. Anyway, it stopped raining and he reappeared to, to, to give it the big shot in the dry. He really went, I mean, properly went for it. You know, they had the huge entourage there and um, the BBC had been quite worried about the potential liability issues. So there was a general impression that they didn't want me to teach him too much in case he went too fast and then crashed the car. That was, that was what I think I was being told when they were saying, stop teaching him. We'd spent a lot of time in the car going round. He was very, very precise. They don't know exactly what gear, you know, speed, revs, all that kind of stuff. He was a, an incredible student. That, that's what is amazing with Tom Cruise. In the, the movies, he does so many of his stunts because he he will work with the crew to find out with, you know, the stunt coordinator, Wade Eastwood's been working with him now for many years. He's a, you know, super intelligent, very calculating guy. So that, that combination means that they can create these incredible scenarios, but, you know, attach himself to the side of a plane when it takes off and lands. All that kind of stuff is, is all because he, he really learns the, the fine, fine detail. The same with the car. So he was super, super intense on it, which is incredibly rewarding. So, you know, what you put in, he, he could reproduce it. So after I got out, so I'd done my, you know, recce laps with him, jumped out and then was kind of watching and sort of gauging where I thought he'd go a bit faster. Like any lap, the end is when the pressure is highest. You feel your delta is up. This is a good one. This is the one that's going to count. And at that track, the last two corners, you could really make or break because you had to break very late into the penultimate corner. And it was a really good opportunity to skid off into the into the grass and you were done. But if you sliced it just right, you could carry a lot of speed through. But then you were on this little short shoot where the airplanes crossed a lot and there was the surface was covered in avgas. So it was quite slippery. And to get around that, I was explaining to him, if you slice the apex a bit more on the on the final corner, um, there's some concrete and you can try and get the, the wheels across that and you'll you'll cut the line and out you go. Being Tom, he sort of really took this to heart and, and then added a little bit of tax to it. He had all four wheels on the inside of it. And so actually the outer wheels, which were fully loaded, caught the concrete and it flipped the car up. So I was watching this. I'd already been tapped on the shoulder and told to, you know, calm down and stop stopping going so quick. And that was that, up it went. And I was like, wow, he's gonna barrel, he's gonna barrel. He's gonna be the first one to barrel roll this car across the line. And it went up and then it kind of stopped. But as it was up, you could hear him gassing the car, you know, quite fearless. Most people would try and brake or, or do something. And the thing just slammed down onto its wheels and, and through he went. So Tom set the fastest time with that crazy run. I think the lap on the two wheels was not his fastest. 
He then he cut that out and did another lap and sliced it through. So that was the quickest that car went. And I'm not sure if, I think it did get beaten subsequently, but it, he held top spot for a long time. I never drove the Kia for a lap time. The only one I drove competitively was the, the one that was reserved for the racing drivers, the Suzuki. So we would wheel that old thing out. Um, we had Damon Hill, Mark Webber, Lewis Hamilton. I think Lewis went twice. Sebastian Vettel, Rubens Barrichello, who in my opinion is a cheat because they extended the track for him. And then he made a t-shirt saying that he beat the Stig, but you didn't, you had a bigger track. And so I still claim that I've got the fastest time around that track. It was very close. So uh, Nigel Mansell, I think he did a 144.4. Not that I try to memorize these lap times. And I think mine was a 43.7. I've probably got the wrong seconds. Another moment where I thought there's a P45, you're gonna get fired if you don't beat this time. Because Mansell came around, kicked the tires, Drove the wheels off the Liana, never seen anyone drive anything like it. And he was about three seconds quicker than any celebrity had, had driven it. And the following week, I was told I had to go and beat his time. I thought, this is a bit rich. He's the world champion, IndyCar champion, boyhood idol, and um, got to try and beat this man's time. I was then in the hot seat. And then my friends suddenly became, you know, like, you know, gamekeeper turned poacher. They're now staring at me and not telling me what my times were and sort of all, giving it all this aloof business with the, with the lap times. Um, but it all worked out well, and um, I pipped his time. We had a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of the F1 guys, unfortunately for them, the track was a bit damp. I think Weber had a wet track. Lewis had a few damp patches on the track. Damon drove it in the dry. Jensen Button drove it in the dry. In the last corner, the, the track was wearing away. In fact, we always were dropping a wheel off on the penultimate corner. It was chipping away at the mud, so they had to reinforce it with a bit of concrete. And that is the extra element that enabled Rubens to pip my time slightly. So I really, I should go back and see what I could do on the extended surface. So to equalize, there was a, a crazy idea that they'd wet the track for every session for everybody. I suppose you, you could try it. I mean, it would be phenomenally expensive. I know what it costs to hire a Bowser for movie sets. We have to do wet downs. The problem is that it dries out. So you'd be, you'd be at it all day. And for TV, and the way that Top Gear was shot, there was no time to physically do that. And actually it made it pretty interesting. You never really knew what was gonna happen. When we had you know, a car down for the day, we'd obviously try and find a window when it was dry to, sh to shoot a quick lap time. So even if we got the, the B-roll that you were gonna see for the lap, you'd get a lap so the audience could see it. That might not necessarily be the lap that was quickest. So they'd pick the best looking shots and then we'd, we'd try and make sure we got a, a dry window. So it kind of worked out because you know it's rare for a racing track to be totally submerged all day, but, but it does happen. But yeah, that was a mad idea, but I, I, you know, but this is it. It was a new format. They'd never done anything like it before. They came up with these amazing concepts, you know, like having an audience in and you know, a, a character who was behind a helmet. So Star Wars-like, Mandalorian style. All these things were quite new. A couple of other ideas that were jumped quite quickly. The Top Gear dog, he didn't last very long. There was Top Gear stuntman. I think he did about two episodes. He was quite cool. I thought he had legs, but um, he did, they didn't keep him. So there was a few things that came and went and you never knew with the Stig thing, I was always expecting at any moment that that was gonna be the last day. And actually the, the day I thought was gonna be my last was when we had, well, I didn't know what was happening. I was, I was being asked what size race suit and shoes I had and helmet. And I thought, it sounds like there's, uh, there's gonna be some kind of death or replacement happening. They were trying to size up um, a suit for Michael Schumacher who was coming in that day. Um, but by the time he'd gone there, they'd said, you know, can you do a really bad lap? And I thought, this is, this is how I'm gonna die. I'm gonna... So I filmed the bad lap and I was really, my heart was kind of breaking. I thought, I've, I'm filming my own death. So I'm gonna film this, this terrible lap in, a, in the Suzuki to sort of explain that the Stig's lost his mojo. So we've had to get rid of him. But actually it was a, it was a weird ruse. And it was, <laughs> I was dressed as the Stig pretending to be Schumacher who was pretending to be the Stig. So it was, it was a few leaps of logic with that. I never really understood how it worked. Anyway, he came in with the Ferrari FXX, and I think he hadn't wanted to drive the Suzuki, which is fair enough, a sensible move. But we were both dressed in a white suit, and um, I went to go meet him when he was in his motorhome, having his bowl of, I think, cornflakes at the time um, to get ready for the day. And it was amazing, I'm meeting the legend, multiple world champion. Um, he just retired from F1, it was before he went back into it. But you could tell he was really missing it, because um, he was still reminiscing about F1. He was in a go-kart, I think on a daily basis, he was racing bikes. So it didn't sound like someone who was ready to stop living pretty fast. And watching him in the FXX was, was pretty incredible. He had a very sharp style. 
So the follow through, it's, you know, it's a fast corner. He's normally trying to be quite smooth carrying speed in, and he was very directional. He really um, tilted the steering wheel very hard on the car. Car was obviously set up for that, kind of pretty much developed around him and his driving style. So he's very aggressive turn in and extremely fast. Slightly embarrassing in that I'd shown him the lap in a, I think it was a diesel Jag. I was so impressed that I was showing Michael Schumacher the track. I was looking in my mirror and dropped off the corner of the track that I was mentioning and actually sprayed a load of gravel at his really expensive supercar. Um, and he was fast enough to miss it, but he must have thought this guy's a complete plonker. Hopefully not. Anyway, he was uh, he was rapid and hammered that thing to within an inch of its life, then jumped back on his private jet and he was off. Car fires make for great videos, but very bad days for car owners. And I protect my cars from fire by having an element extinguisher in every one of them for every mile. I actually got my first one from Freddie a few years ago as we were shooting Car Trek 1, where a fire was a very real risk, but it's always important to be protected. Element fire extinguishers weigh less than a tenth of what a traditional fire extinguisher weighs, and they discharge five times longer. They also make no mess, and they never expire. So it's worth picking up a few to have around the garage, your house, and of course, in your car. They've got a special bundle offer right now during the month of May for our Vinwiki viewers, but it's always a good time to buy a couple of these to keep you your car, and your home safe. So check them out now at the link in the description below.